have to become more dependent upon the Spirit in the presence of God. We have to be dependent upon the leading of His, of his Spirit. Um, you know, we, we can get into life and, and, and we take for granted, and this is one of the things I believe as believers we do too much, is we take for granted the presence of God in our lives and the fellowship uh, of the saints. And, and when, we, when we look at, you know, the world, we forget that Christ has opened our eyes because our eyes have been open for, for some time. We forget that, that he has given us uh, understanding that the world doesn't have. And, and sometimes we look at the world and we're, we're just kind of like, you know, why are they acting like that? Or why are they doing that? Or what, what's going on in their life? And, and because sometimes we take for granted the spirit and the presence of God in our lives that we don't realize they don't have what we have. And what we have, it's, it's not merely just something that, is, that you can learn. It's something that only Christ can give. And uh, it, it's a wisdom that is not of this world. It's an understanding that is not of this world. And it's brought to us by the Holy Spirit of God. Now, we've been, we've been dealing with this uh, for some time now. And I, and I want to just continue to drive this, this home uh, with, with you and I today. But in... Uh, in Luke chapter 10 uh, is, is, is the first thought of, of where we're going to be at this morning, Luke chapter 10, and it's something that Jesus declared to you and I that he was going to give us, and, uh, and I want to start there, but we're not, going to, we're not going to finish there, but in Luke chapter 10, if you'd stand for the reading of God's word, and, we're going to, and then after that, we're going to go right over to... Uh, Romans chapter 8, and then we'll get on uh, with the teaching and uh, with the message. But Luke chapter 10 and 19, it says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And if you'd go over to Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, and we're going to start right there with verse 1. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. There's a, there's a, there's a paradigm there that, that cannot be bridged um, any other way, because these two worlds are completely opposites and separate, the flesh and the spirit. The flesh and the spirit, the Bible tells us, they war once again, one against another. And, and so he continues, verse 2, he says, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and, and I want to stress that, could not do, in that it was weak in the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your presence, God. We thank you for... Uh, your presence, Holy Spirit, this morning as you, as you dwell among us. And help us, Lord, to value the spiritual, the eternal things. That, Father, that we may live a life of peace. And that, Father, that your Spirit, God, would lead us. And that, God, that we would be free in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. For the glory and the honor of your name we pray. Amen. I don't take for granted and I don't take lightly the word of God. Uh, and I pray that, that none of us will or ever will take lightly what God uh, is speaking uh, through his word. Now, we've been talking about the difference and the contrast between these two worlds. We've been talking about what Jesus has given us through the spirit. We talked about how Jesus, when he said, when when he, the Spirit, comes, he will lead you into all truth, and he'll speak of me. He won't speak of his own accord. 
just as Jesus said, I don't speak about myself, but I, but I say those things that I hear my father say, and I do those things that I, I see my father do. And, and then he tells us, as, as, as I, he was in this world, so are we, meaning we don't speak of our own accord, and we don't seek our own things, and we don't seek our own desires. Now, the flesh desires carnal things. It desires fleshly things. This is why many times when, when we, we think something will bring us happiness and we possess it, we realize that it doesn't bring us the happiness that we thought it would. So, so you, you desire something in this world, maybe, maybe a new home or, or a new car. And uh, many, many I, I remember even as a child, uh, one of the things because the gospel was preached so hard in, in, in the matter of Jesus is coming soon, that, that many, uh, much of the longing of young men and women were, if I could just get married, right? And, and I, remember, I remember after we had got married, my wife said, I never thought we would do, I'd, I'd ever get married. She says, because, because we thought Jesus was coming. And you know what? He could come even today before we finish up. And that's, that's a true fact. But I remember she, she was saying, if, 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 if we could just buy our own, our own home, buy our own home, and, and you know, you buy your own home, and what happens to it? You need to replace the roof, the thing gets cluttered, I mean, you got to mow the grass, the, the plumbing goes out, something goes wrong, it's always something, and it never brings or satisfies you the way that you thought that it would satisfy you. And, and we get caught up in this, and we get caught up in this, and then because it doesn't satisfy, and, and, you, and, and, and many of us here today would, would say, you know what, but pastor, if I just, if I just had a million dollars, everything would be okay. Ask that to the millionaires that are laying in a grave tonight that took their own lives because money didn't bring them happiness. And see, and we, we see that perspective and we say, well, why in the world? How is it that they, that they would do such a thing? And, you know, if I had that, yeah, but the, you have something they don't and you don't realize it. And this is what I mean is many times we don't realize that we have been saved. We have been delivered. Our eyes have been opened. We've been given the eternal uh, treasure. And, and as we get into this, we're going to see that these things, the things that are carnal, the things that are earthly, they don't matter and they don't bring happiness. But there are some things that do. And the only thing that really does is your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, because we need to begin to live in an eternal perspective. We need to begin to live with eternity in mind. Because as we live with eternity in mind, we will begin to live a more fulfilled and purposeful life. You see, we, we, if, if we're always foc- focusing on the carnal things, we'll never be satisfied. It'll always be what's next. What's your next achievement? What's your next goal? Because the things of this world, they fade, they get old, they rust, they break down, they burn up, and they won't last forever. One thought that I've always, that, I, that every, every once in a while just keeps, it comes through my mind is, is I, I just think about in, in this term, within a hundred years, for the most part in a hundred years, not one person on this planet will be alive. It'll be a whole new group of people. That's, that's a perspective that, that, that it, it confounds me sometimes. That within a hundred years, most everyone that's on the planet will have gone and met their maker. One way or the other. So Jesus says to us, he says, I give you, I give you power. I give you power over all the power of the devil. Why would I need power over the power of the devil? Because I can tell you this, because the battle that we're in and the struggle that we're facing, it's not a, an earthly struggle. It's not a, a struggle that is, that is going to end in this life, just merely in this life. This is a spiritual struggle. It is a struggle that is out of this world. It is a struggle for your eternal life, your eternal existence, your eternal salvation, and not just yours, but it 
it is the struggle for the eternity, the, the eternal life of someone else that is fighting, that needs help. You and I have been called to live a life that is, that is holy and honorable and pleasing to God. A life that is powerful, powerful against the enemy, powerful against the, 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 the powers of this world. And so therefore, Jesus says, I give you power over all the power of the devil. But in order to do that, we have to learn the, to be led by the Holy Spirit. We need to learn the, the Spirit of God, His leadership, and, and we, need to, we need to desire the things of God more than the, the things of this world. And I would say, over all the things of this world. See, the things of this world, eventually, they're going to fade. All of the things that you're desiring, you're working hard toward, and everything else will one day be gone. And here's, here's, here's a, a something. Let me just give you a heads up. You can't take it with you. You could walk out of this room today and never return and move on into eternity today, and you can't take any of it with you. But the life that is eternal, no one can take away from you if, you, if, you, if you're following Jesus Christ. So, so here's the thing. Jesus says, I give you. I, 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 I have something, I'm giving it to you. And, and, this is, and, and I want to stress this because this is where we have been uh, dealing with. Because as spiritual people, there are spiritual principles in place that we need to follow. And, and the one that I've been dealing with lately is the, the, the principle of prayer. Prayer. Prayer is so important to us. Prayer is the battlefield. The altar is, is where the war is either won or are lost it is in the altar we talk about prayer we talk about the prayer meetings we 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 can talk about prayer but it will do no good unless we actually pray and this is what most believers don't realize well i i know all about prayer i know you know all about prayer and i'm being redundant this morning the thing is is do you pray and do you know how to pray effectively and, and are your prayers, do you believe your prayers are being heard? And, 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 and do you believe that prayer is truly powerful or is that just a mere statement that you adhere to because it's the right thing to believe? Or do you bring pray, prayer against all the power of hell and against the power of, uh, of this world and the things that you're facing because you know that if you pray, you will overcome? One thing I, 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 I will not do is, is, as Paul said, I will not be brought under the power of any. Why? Because Christ has given me the power over all of it. And this isn't arrogance. This is assurance. I know that when I pray, I know that my prayers are heard. As Jesus stood outside the tomb of Lazarus, he says with a loud voice, he says, Father, I thank you that you hear me every time I pray. Meaning, if you hear me, you'll answer me. Because I don't pray against your will, I pray according to your will. We discussed this even last week, and we, we, we went into more detail, but, but here's the thing. We, we've, we've made less of the principles of God because, and, and there's no other reason today, but because we don't believe that they're real. No other reason. If you say you believe and you don't obey, then you don't believe anything. You, you can say you believe, but biblical belief is, is believing and doing, following through, uh, going through with the principles that the word of God has, has stated. Um, here's the thing, and this is something that God has put on my heart just even, even recently, uh, something that, that we should know, something that has been there for a long time, but, but here's the thing, God has a standard. How many of us know that God has a standard? I, God has a standard. He says, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And, and can I tell you this? What we've done is, is, is we've tried to take his, take his standard and we've tried to lower it. Because we thought, we thought the, 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 that the apostles, we thought those that had come after them, 
uh, had, had preached too, 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 too high for anybody to reach. We, we thought that they, they, were, they were reaching for something that was unattainable. And, and, and it is in your own strength and in your own power. But, but, so what we've done is said, you know what, we're going to lower the standard. And, we, and, we, and then finally, we've come to a generation that took, just took the bar and dropped it to the floor and said, here's the standard. And this is the reason why you can't tell a Christian from a non-Christian. Because nobody, nobody stands for anything anymore. Nobody lives for anything anymore. And, 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 we, and we, so in, in, in that understanding, that, that vacuum, if you would, all of a sudden, all these false teachings move in. Now we say there's carnal Christians. I can tell you this, there are no, there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. A Christian is a Christian is a Christian. Every Christian, I've, I've made this statement, every Christian is an intercessor. Every Christian. Why? Jesus was prayed. He went to, coming from, everything he did on this earth, he prayed. What is he doing right now? The Bible says he is seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for this meeting this morning on your behalf and on mine, that his word would be preached, that his power would be revealed, and that his spirit would move among us. And he's, and he's making intercession. Now he says, now his word says, and inspired by the Holy Spirit, that as he was in this world, so are you. So every believer is an intercessor. If you are not praying and interceding for your brothers and sisters or someone else that is in need or the unbeliever, then you might need to ask yourself and take inventory, am I really a Christian? And then we, and then we, then we, then we say, well, well, that's a gift. No, intercession isn't a gift or merely a calling. Intercession is what a believer is. And then, and then, holy is what we are because He is holy. We are holy. Now you're making this about works. No, I'm not. It's about faith. It's about depending upon Him. And then we say there, that, that, that there's such thing as, 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 as a Christian can, can be proud. No, you can't. Because pride is of the devil. And there are no true proud Christians. I, I know that that's a hard word. But it's the truth. And we have to confront it. And this is the thing. If there's something in me, I've got to bring it to God and say, God, I see this in me. Help me. Why? Because if I don't, the enemy's going to use that against me, and I'm going to be powerless, and eventually he's going to win the battle. You say, well, pastor, you have to be sensitive. I know the Spirit of God will be sensitive with you. He will lead you into all truth. He will comfort you. He will guide you. He will strengthen you. That's really what the word comforter means. Not merely just pick you up in, your, in his arms and, and, oh, poor little baby. No, he will strengthen you for whatever it is that you are facing. He'll comfort you. See, when we walk in the Spirit, there's peace, there's power. So that we're, our prayers mean something to God. Prayer is, is one of the greatest weapons that we have on this side of heaven. One thing, I, I, and, and you know, and, I, and, I, and I'm not harping on anyone. I really, I'm, I'm not. But we don't offer things in this church just to look busy. We, we don't offer things in this church just so that we can say, oh, we're, we have this and we have that and we have this and we have that. We have women's group, we have men's group, we have prayer, we have this. And so, so there's something for everyone. We don't do that for that reason. But here's, here's the thing. If you're not plugged in to a woman's ministry or men's ministry or something else, uh, you're not getting the full gospel. If you're not plugged into a small group, you're not, I'm telling you, plug in. Why? You, you might say, and, and this is something that, that there was three of us at, at, at our men's meeting yesterday. And, I, and again, I'm not trying to, but here's the thing. There were three of us. The meetings have been so powerful. 
And, 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 and I'm sitting here thinking, the, the same people that aren't in the meeting will be in my office in six months. When they could have had God and his word and his spirit ministering to them right here, right now. The same thing with the women's. If you're missing out on the women's ministry, you are missing out big time because you need the word and you need the fellowship and you need the encouragement from other women. It's, it's sad when, when we offer these things and, and we, we take time out of our day. We know that it's needed. We know that it's necessary. We're going to do it anyway. If only two of us show up, we're still going to teach it. And you know what? It's going to be powerful and anyone who comes will be blessed. Take advantage of it. Because, see, here's the thing. These are spiritual principles speaking of eternal things that are helping you and I right here, right now. And they're going to help build you up and strengthen you and equip you and equip your home, equip your family. You're going to be a better husband, better wife, better child, better student, better everything because you are getting the word of God and you are putting it into practice. It's powerful, it's powerful, but these are things, and so the enemy knows that, that if he can do anything, he's going to stop you from praying. He's going to stop you from, from spiritual maturity, because that's what it is. We're growing up. We're, we're maturing in the spirit. We're, we're growing up into the full measure of what it means to be a believer, to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, I know I value my sleep. And, and, but yet I can tell you this, I value my spiritual life more. You see, I value the certain things and, and the things of God more than the things of this world. Every one of us needs sleep. Every one of us, we have things that come up. And I understand that there are sometimes uh, circumstances that, that, that withhold us or stop us. But I can tell you this, at the same time, I can see these circumstances and say, you know what? This is an attack of the enemy, and he's trying to keep me from something. So before I go on, the thing is, is the devil knows that that prayer is powerful, and so one of the things he's going to do is keep you from praying. He's going to keep you from praying because he knows that if you ever, if you ever get in there and understand what prayer is and, and understand the power of prayer and the connection it gives you between you and God, then it will give you victory over all of his power. And so therefore, one thing the devil doesn't want you to do is to pray so he will make you busy. He will make you tired. He will cause family to come over. He will give you all kinds of excuses So that you can say, well, I didn't have time to pray. I didn't have time to do this. But you had time to sit in front of that TV for three or four hours, huh? Did you have time to to surf that that, that internet and get on Facebook for for another two or three hours? You had time to do all the things that that you you wanted to do. And and this is where he's talking about in Romans, that that those that are carnal desire or, or, or value worldly things that only build up the flesh. And, and they don't even build up. Many times they tear you down because you see something somebody says and you're like, well, I just don't know. And you'd have been better off not seeing it in the first place. Because had you spend that time in the word of God in prayer, self-explanatory. You'd have been built up in the spiritual man and ready to fight the enemy. Why? Because the enemy's not going to sleep, he's not going to tire, and he's going to bring in a a battle at any moment, at any time, and and he doesn't want you to be ready for it. See, the Bible says nothing shall be impossible to to those who believe. And so we had talked about this uh, uh, on Wednesday, and, and I wanted to bring this up, but in, in, in the case of Peter, as he, as he, was, as he was there, and uh, him and Mark were, were, were in prison, Mark was murdered, or uh, James was murdered, and, and Peter was, was the next one, and you can find the story in, in Acts chapter 12. But, but the church, the Bible says, went to God in prayer, and they prayed continually. And, and, and this thought had crossed my mind, and, and, and I had mentioned it on Wednesday, and, and something for, for you to think about. 
How many of us, and I, and I don't need to raise a hand, but, but how many of us know what it was like it, when, when we were children or when we were younger and we used to go to church? Do, do you ever remember they used, to, they used to sometimes put a chart up on the wall and they said, who's going to pray from this time to this time? And they'd cover that thing. They'd cover every slot from, from, from one to two. Who's going to pray? And the ones that were always the hardest to fit in were, were, were from midnight to like six in the morning. And there were a few brave people that said, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll pray. I'll pray from 1 a.m. To, to 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. I'll pray. And, and you had those that, and you knew that they were going to get up and you knew they were going to pray. And, and, and why did they do that? Because they believed in the principle of prayer. And you see it as, as Peter is in there, and this is the power of prayer. This is the value of spiritual things. They saw that P Peter was in trouble because of what had just happened to James. So the Bible says that the church went to prayer, and they prayed continually around the clock. They prayed. They didn't stop. They prayed without ceasing. Why did they do that? Because they knew that if they could get a hold of God, he would release an angel from eternity, and they, he would go and re release their pastor. And that's exactly what God did. That Bible says that the angel of the Lord went in and he, and he woke Peter up, picked him up, walked him outside the city. Peter didn't even realize it shows up at the church, at the, at, at the door where they were all praying. They, 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 their answer was there at the door. And they didn't stop praying until the answer showed up. Peter standing in front of them. And you know what? Peter didn't go there to say, oh, you know what? I'm going to hide out here. No. Peter went somewhere else after he came to them and said, your prayers are answered. You, you can now pray for something else. I've been delivered. I've been set free. The angel of the Lord has set me free. Now you're free to pray for somebody else because I'm going over here because I still have to minister. And he believed in prayer. They believed in prayer and they did it. The reason we don't pray is, as I said again, we don't believe it works. Our children will be found sometime in a need. And we'll call somebody, please pray. And, and, but, but, but have you prayed? And how much have you prayed? Have you prayed in prevailing prayer over their lives? Are you willing to give everything so that they can be released from that, from that thing? Jesus said, I give you power over all the power of the devil. That by, by any means, nothing shall hurt you. You see, we, we have to recognize this truth. I can do nothing in myself. I want you to think about that statement. I can do nothing in myself. That means whatever I can accomplish is worthless when it comes to spiritual warfare, when it comes to truly spiritual things. Now, if I pray, that's different. If I'm reading the Word of God and, and studying His Word, not just to study it, but for, for, to build up myself in my most holy faith, then it's making a difference. But you think about this. My talent won't get me anywhere in this life. My education won't get me anywhere if I'm just basing it, base it just only upon my education. What does, it, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul in hell? What if you, what if you got 20 doctorates? What if, you, what if you attain everything that you, that you thought was necessary in this life? What if, you, what if you made billions of dollars and you still went to hell in the end? What have you accomplished? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I can do nothing in myself, but I can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives me strength. You see, again, I, I, I always feel like I have to say, I'm not making a plea for ignorance. I believe that you should educate yourself. But do it for the glory of God. Every day, I'm telling you, my children can, can testify to this. I take them when I'm dropping them off at school, I, I, and, and, and even if they had a test, I'm praying, God, prepare them for the calling as they go into this place to study. Prepare them for the calling that you have placed upon their lives. The things that they learn today, help them to use those things for your glory and your honor. 
Not just so that they can get a plaque to put on a wall, but so that they can glorify their Father in heaven with whatever they accomplish through his power. So Christ, Christ today is it has given us, even today, he's given us power. See, the Bible, the word of God is, is today, it's saying yet today, yesterday, and forever. God's word never changes. It's still relevant for us today. It's still powerful today. So there was never a situation or a problem that Christ couldn't overcome. You see, and, and, and he tells you and I, I give you this same power that I had So that you can overcome over all the power of the devil, over all the power of the enemy. Now I want you to think about this. He broke up a funeral by raising the dead. As as he was in this world, so are we. He confronted a man that, that was possessed with a thousand devils. And the man was set free from, from the power of the devil. He met a man who was born blind. He touched his eyes and said, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And the man's eyes, his, his sight had come. To a sick man for 38 years, he could say, take up your bed and, and walk. To the, to the man with palsy, he said, your sins be forgiven. Now the religious that were standing around argued him on this point, And he said, which is easier, your sins forgiven or rise up and walk? He was constantly coming against the power of Satan and against the power of hell. Because every one of these instances is because Satan had wreaked havoc in somebody's life. And Satan was, Satan was going about and undoing the, the, and, 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 and bringing, you know, damnation and hell and, and torture to these people. And there are tormenting spirits. And and Jesus knew it, so he went about healing those that were sick and delivering them under the power of the the Spirit of God. He could walk on the water, he could speak to the water, and it would quiet and calm just just as glass. It was the power that he had given to the church. See, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a watered down. It wasn't a diluted power. It was a power over all the power of the devil. We Many times we look at the word of God and we say, wow, Jesus did some great things. And he did. And we glorify his name. But he said, greater things will you do than I have done. We don't believe that. You know why? Because if we did believe it, we would be doing it. You see, when's the last time that you prayed with an assurance, with a boldness, with a confidence that whatever I pray and whatever I say in prayer, it will come to pass? You see, when somebody comes and and, and I got even that call at two in the morning, I got that text message, can you pray? You know what? I didn't say, well, you know what? Yeah, we're praying. I got up and I started praying. Why? Why? Because I believe in the power of prayer. You should believe in the power of prayer. Don't tell me you're going to pray if you don't believe in it. If I believe in prayer, I'm going to pray. If I believe that God said, told me to do something, I'm going to do it. And I can't sit around asking questions or or twiddling my thumbs and hoping something come to pass. No, I have to get out and do something about it. That's what believing is. That's what believing prayer is. See, this is, the, this is the same Christ that in today's world, by virtue of the Holy Spirit, dwells in us. It's the same Christ. God, God isn't interested in, in a lot of the things that we are, that, that we are interested in. He, he's not as interested in, 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 in your, your prosperity He's not as interested in where you are today in, in the sense of the, the standards of the world. He is more interested in your eternal condition than he is anything else today. That's why sometimes we look at our lives and we say, well, I don't understand why this is going on. I can tell you this. It's because God is working something greater out in you and me. And, and, it, and it isn't always the way that it, seem, it should seem to us. We would think, well, I would do it this way. God says, that's why I'm not doing it that way. Because it doesn't work like that. See, we were born for this very reason, that Christ could live in us and through us. 
And this is the truth. There's no situation that we cannot overcome. Then the Bible says in Matthew 17 and 21, and I want to get into this principle right here. In Matthew 17, 21, he says, This kind cometh out but by prayer and fasting. Now, some of your Bibles might not have that word fasting in there, but it's in mine. You see, because, because here's, here's what happens. When you, when you fast, you put down the flesh. You, 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 you take away from your own flesh. You, you remove things. You remove food. You remove the desires. Your, your flesh begins to break down. But when you pray, you lift up the spirit. You see, the, the, the problem is, is that we are too much of the time lifting up the flesh and depriving the spirit. We are lifting up the flesh and we are depriving the spirit. What do you mean, pastor? We feed this, we won't miss a meal. And, and, and if we do, and if we do, it's because I'm trying to get my flesh better. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm working out. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And, and it's all about my flesh now. It's, and, and, and I'm not talking about not taking care of the, the, the temple of God because your body is the temple of God. But, but don't say you're taking care of the temple of God if that is not your intention. See, we mask it. We hide it behind a lot of those things. So we say, well, I'm not going to, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to miss a meal. Uh, I, and then we'll call it fasting, but really it's just a diet because we didn't pray and we didn't read and we didn't seek and we didn't do all those things that are required in fasting. The Bible says, when, and, and, and if you want to understand truly what real fasting is, go, you can go to Isaiah 58 and read it on your own time. He says, he says in that time, he says, then, then whatever you would have spent, whatever you would have done or given to fasting, you give that to the poor. Oh, but I was trying to save that money. If you're really fasting for the glory of God, then he says, then you take that, what you would have spent in, in your own food, and you give that to the poor, you give it to the to, to missions, you give it to whatever. So that, that $20, $30 you'd have spent, 15 5 whatever it is, you give that to the poor, feed somebody else. And then you spend time in prayer and fasting. Why? Because you're bringing the flesh down. And what you're saying is, is you don't always get your way. But the Bible says that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And the spirit and the flesh are constantly warring against one another. And I can tell you this, on the outside, and, and, and most, most uh, Christians are probably stronger in the flesh than they are in the spirit. If, we, if I could pull your spirit out and set it beside your flesh, you would see a feeble, bound up, shriveled up person because you haven't, fed him you know you need to feed yourself at least two three meals a day how many times do you feed your spirit and i tell you what you don't get it you don't get that food you start you start getting what we call hangry <laughs> you get angry because you're hungry and 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 that's the that's the problem is the flesh whines and the flesh boasts and the flesh wants and the flesh desires and therefore you're never getting anywhere because, because you are not feeding the spiritual man. Because you're not praying, because you're not fasting, because you're not doing... Well, that's all, that's all legalism. That's not legalism, that's, that's obedience. Because Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do what I, that, do what I say. You'll obey me. And, and so it's discipline. It's learning how to be disciplined. See, it's, it's easier to, to, to have a, a, a contest in, in, than it is to pray. So, so we can come to church and we can say, you know what, we're going to have a contest. Or, or you know what, we're going we're gonna to raise money for missions. Or we're going to, you, you know, we're going to have a bicycle. Which All those things are fine. But it's easier to do those things. Why? Because those things appeal to the flesh. But when you say, you know what, we're going to pray and we're going to fast. Well, God didn't call me for that. We instantly begin to argue against those things. 
See, it's, it's, it's easier to, main, to, to major in the externals of, religious, uh, of a religious order than it is to come to grips with the spirit world. It's easier to look at the outside and, and look at the different denominations and it's easier to pick them apart and it's easy, easier to, to go through the motions. It's easier to do all of those things than it is to actually fast and pray. You see, the, the, the devil doesn't have a problem with all of these things because he already has you. He has you bound. He has a place to work from. The enemy knows that, the real, that, that real faith is only released in prayer. That real faith and real power is only released in prayer. And this kind of faith is an aggressive faith. It's a faith that moves forward. It's a faith that doesn't settle for nothing. It's a faith that that continues on and presses in. It presses into its fear. It presses past the fear. It continues and it moves. It's not stopped by fear. It doesn't back away from fear. It moves in. It says, I see the fear. I acknowledge the fear, but I refuse its right and its power over me. But you don't get that kind of faith unless you're a true believer, unless you're praying and the Spirit of God is, is, is clothing you with power. It's not merely about being brave. Be strong and very courageous. For, for I am your God. I, the Lord, your God, am with you. That's why you need to be strong and courageous. And how do I know that he's with me? Because, because I spend time with him. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. But here's the thing. There's something that we must do. So we can spend all our time begging God to do something. All the while, he said, I've given you power. And we do this. And that's, that, that's, that's, a, that's a true, we spend all of our time, God please, God please, and, and he's sitting there saying, I've already given you power. God, you see this devil that is, that is that, that, or, or this addiction that my child is, is going through. And God, I need, and, and, and he's saying, I've given you power over all the power of the devil. You go speak to that thing now. The thing is, is we don't want to do the work. We want somebody else to do it for us. Just like when God was getting ready to bring the children of Israel to to Mount Sinai. And he told Moses, he says, have them consecrate themselves against the third day. Have them fast, have them pray, get them ready. And they all started getting ready. And they're coming up to the mountain. All of a sudden, the clouds move in, the lightning moves in. And they see the power of God. And all God is doing is showing up. Because that God, God, God isn't showing off. He's just showing up. A lot of people try to think God's showing. He doesn't have to show off. He just shows up. And when he shows up, he comes in authority. He comes in power. He walks upon the wings of the wind. He walks and the clouds turn dark. He walks and the lightning strikes. He is God and there is none like him. And so they saw them and they feared and they said, no, 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 Moses. You go talk to God and you come back and tell us what he said. We like it this way. And God, I I can only imagine his disappointment. He was excited. He wanted to see his people He wanted to have that relationship with them. And they said, no, we don't want any of it. Because it's going to cost us something. And you scare us, God. And God, if we are his children, we should not be afraid. Not in that sense. Now, as a child of God, if I'm being disobedient, I better be afraid. Because he disciplines those that he loves. We don't want to be disciplined by God. If you don't want to be disciplined by God, then, then you're no child of his. That's what you're saying. I don't want to be your child. But see, it pleased God. The Bible says to reveal his son in me, in Galatians 1, 5 and, uh, 15 and 16. It pleased God to reveal his son in me. See, I've given you power, he said. I've given you a power to to take away the reproach of, of, of those. I've given you power to loose the captives. But see, the Bible says it pleased God to reveal his son in me. See, God isn't interested in whether you are prosperous or not. He's interested in living his life through you. That's what he's interested in. You being so full of his presence and so full of his spirit. You know... Uh, godliness 
With contentment, the Bible says, is great gain. 1 Timothy 6 and 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, I want you to think about this because there's a lot of people out there that, that they feel like, you know, if I only had, as we were talking, oh, if I only had this, if I only had that. Philippians 4.11 says, in whatsoever state I'm in, I've learned to be content. I've had a lot, Paul says. I've had, I've, 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 I've had plenty. I've had nothing. But in any situation I'm in, I've learned to be content. Why? Because if God is with me, who can be against me? And if God is, is, is my portion, what else do I need? What else do I need, honestly, if, if God is my portion? See, we are here that God ha- may reveal his son in us. And through us, and, and, and when, this, when it comes right down to it, nothing else matters but Jesus Christ being glorified, Jesus Christ living in me. See, nothing else matters. Jesus, Jesus may not look the same in me as he does in you, but he's just as beautiful. He loves us. He wants to reveal himself to us. He wants to have relationship with us. He wants to come and dwell in us. We, the Bible said, we, the Bible says, are the temple of God. We are the dwelling place of God. God lives in us. Mm, Now that, 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 I mean, until you get a revelation of that, you may not understand anything. Somebody says they're coming over your house. What do you do? Oh, you got certain rooms, right? That nobody goes into? (laughs) We know what happens, trust me. (laughs) Happens at our house too. But we have certain rooms nobody goes into. Why? Because because all the extra stuff, all the stuff that's just laying around, we kind of try to go in there and, and, and... But God is saying, I, I, I'm not just coming over to visit. I'm coming to take residence. Meaning, meaning I have access into every room of your home, into every thought that you have, into every place, into every behavior and act that you will commit. I have residence in there. Now, what are you going to do then? You're going to do a spring cleaning is what you're going to do. If, if somebody important comes and says, you know what, I'm going to be staying with you over the summer, and you know that they're going to have access into everything, what are you going to do? You're going to get ready a long time, and, and you're going to be putting things away, cleaning things up, making sure everything's right, and doing it to the best of your ability. But yet we say, well, God wants to take residence in you. Oh, well, then he's just going to have to accept me how I am. He's just going to have to take me the way that I am. Rather than saying, you know what, I want to give everything to to him. And I want to live in a way that is honoring and pleasing to you, God. You tell me what needs to be done. And I can tell you, he told us what needs to be done right here. And he expects us to take care of it. See, see, he's not going to come in there and, and do it. He says, I've given you power over all the power of the devil. Well, well, it's just this addiction it has such a hold on me. He says, I've given you power over all the power of the devil. The, 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 I, I believe the strongest thing that you need to break is that your desire for that thing. And you need to begin to pray that God's power, bring God's power against your desire for that thing. And, and one of the greatest ways to do that, and I'm going to say it, and you might not like it, is fasting. You know what fasting is? Getting rid of whatever it is. Not only getting rid of food. Yeah, food is always the thing when you, get, when you come to fasting. But, but that means, that means if, if you have a problem getting on the internet, then get rid of the internet. What do you mean? Then I won't be able to do everything else. Then, then you know what? There's programs out there that you can limit yourself. And, and every time you click on something, your spouse can know where you went. And every time your child clicks on something, you can know where they've gone. And, and, and then people might say, well, well, that's being a helicopter parent. No, that's being a parent. That's, that's, that's caring more about their eternal state than them liking me as their friend. That's me being, being godly in their life and watching out so that those addictions and things are not used against them by the power of the devil. Because Satan will do those things and use those things against them and eventually destroy them if you as the parent don't step in and do something about it. Leave it for somebody else to do. We leave a lot lot of things for other people to do, but this is the thing. See, God says, I've given you power over all the power of uh, of the devil. 
speaking of the apostles, the Holy Ghost said that they were ignorant, unlearned, so that when you read their messages, Peter and those fishermen and what they preached and the epistles that they wrote, you would know that it was God and not them. You see, one of the things, one of, one of our biggest excuses as, as human beings, and I, and I won't take too much longer, Julio, you want to come, is I can't. And, and, and it's really not that you can't, it's just you won't. It, it, it's not that you can't, it's, it's I really don't feel like putting the extra effort into it. You see, if, if you say, well, well I, I can't go back to school, what you're really saying is, I don't really want to put the extra effort into going back to school. When you say, when, a, when, you, when your child comes to you and says, I just, I just can't write, what they're saying is, I don't want to put the extra effort into writing. When they say, I can't do math, it's, it's, it's really what they're saying is, is, I don't want to put the extra effort it's going to take for me to understand and to learn math. What you need to do is say, okay, well, you know, if you, if you don't want to learn your math, then, then you know what coding is? Coding has a lot to do with mathematics. And so therefore, if you can't do math, then you don't get internet. They'll learn math real quick. You see, we become lazy. And so now you bring that into our spiritual side, into the spiritual realm. I can't pray. What you're saying is, I don't want to put the extra effort into prayer. And, and, and here's, and, and here, and, and you, you might be saying, Pastor, you're putting words in my mouth. Is what you're saying is, because I don't think the benefit is worth the work. That's hard. I, I, I have these issues in my life. I have some things that I, that I know I need to deal with. Some strongholds in my life. Well, God says in his word, this kind comes out but by prayer and fasting. Well, I don't want to fast because I don't want to put the extra effort into it because I don't believe it'll be beneficial. I don't believe God. You see, if you knew the freedom that you could have, and you, you, and you know, and a lot of times what happens is you, you come to church and, and a pastor will lie to you and he'll tell you, you know, everything's okay and you're going to be okay and this and that's going to happen and I'm going to be praying and God's going to, and, and, and just because, well, he'll have to deal and stand up with God one day on that. But here's the thing. You might even come to church and say, well, I, that's why I came to church is so that God could deliver me here. I'm going to tell you just like Jesus told us. Jesus said to me, and he's saying to you right now, I have given you, each one of you, power over all the power of the devil. Meaning Christ in me is the same Christ that dwells in you. So what you need to do is you need to begin to apply praying and you need to begin to apply fasting. You need to, to begin to, to study the word of God. You need to begin to give yourself to the things of God and you will get the same results I get.
Isn't that amazing? But you're a pastor. It doesn't matter. That's what he was telling Moses when he he told them, get all the people ready. And, And this is an Old Testament. He was basically saying, I want a priesthood for my people. I want every one of them to have that relationship that you have with me, Moses. I want it now, and I want them to have it. And they refused it. And so Jesus comes, and he offers it to everyone. And he says, Jesus is saying, the same relationship that I have as I'm one with my father You can be one with me and one with him. And everything I've accomplished in this life, you can accomplish also. And he says, and greater things. But see, we're we're always, and I and I think sometimes that's that's why we've we and, and I pray that we break that mentality. We come to church to learn. We come to church so that we can be strengthened and built up in our most holy faith. We come to church because because maybe you will hear something and get a revelation from God and begin to put something into action. But see, here's the thing. You are being built up. That's why we come to church, not merely to, to, to come so that we can just, somebody can take our problems away. I, 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 I thought about this. If we put, because, because a lot of times, if you get sick, if you get sick, you are going to put everything into into getting well. If the doctor tells you, you keep eating like this, you'll stop eating like that. At least most people. If the doctor says, if you keep doing that, you'd stop doing it. Now, if we focused and put that much intensity upon sin and against the devil as we did in our our health, and imagine where we'd be. I can tell you this. Gyms are full. Today, the gyms and the the CrossFits and all those things, they'll be full tomorrow. And and, and then they'll be full Tuesday. They'll be full Wednesday. They'll be full Thursday. They'll be full Friday, Saturday. And they'll be full next Sunday again. Seven days a week, 24 hours. And, And most of the people that are going to those things will go at least two to, to, to five or six days or some of them even seven days a week. But then they say, well, I, but I can't go to church. You see, if we put as much emphasis on our spiritual life as we did in our physical life, imagine the spiritual giants we'd be. And they don't spend just, and most of them don't spend just, just 30 minutes in a gym. And some people say, well, I just wish he, he just wouldn't preach as long. I just wish I could go home. I got a lot of things to do. No, they'll go and spend an hour. They'll spend two hours. Some of them spend three or four hours in the gym every day. For what? Goodness, who's got time for that? But they'll do it because it's building up their flesh. But my goodness, you better have me in and out of here in 45 minutes, Pastor. You better hurry up because I've got something to do. I've got places to go. I've got people to meet. I've got things to eat. I've got shows to watch. I've got a game to get to. I've got this and I've got that and my kids have this. And you know what, Pastor? There's a lot more. I'm just, I'm just going through the motions and I'm just fulfilling my duty and I'm just doing the thing. And, and, then, and then I'll be sitting with you in the office in six months. Because your life is a wreck. Because you didn't come to church to get built up in your most holy faith. You just basically came like, the, like the, those, those men of Gadara. When Jesus had cast the devil out, those devils out of the man, and the pigs ran into the water and died, and, and their response to Jesus was, their, their response was, 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 look at this. Where's our pigs? And so a lot of people just come to church because they want Jesus to solve their problem, but they want him to save their pigs in the process. <laughs> In other words, they don't, want, they don't want anything to change in their own life. They just want Jesus to come and solve their problems. And Jesus says to you, if you come to me, I'll give you power over all the power of the devil. But you'll have to use it. You'll have to grow in it. You'll, you'll, you'll have to do... You won't hear that everywhere. But I can tell you this. If you want to be a, a true believer, a strong Christian then this is the way it's going to happen. Would you stand this morning?
The Bible says that the gates of hell cannot and will not prevail against us. But against what? The gates of hell will not prevail against an aggressive faith. A faith that moves, a faith that refuses to be silenced. And this, I, I mean, we could go... Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And they tried to shut him up. And he wouldn't shut up. They said, he doesn't have time for you. Be quiet. Just sit back there. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The, the, the louder the crowd got, the louder he got. Why? His faith he was going to take hold of Jesus Christ. And no one was going to stop him. And no one was going to get between him and the miracle. But yet we... We face opposition only to, to turn away. See, and the only thing that the devil knows anything about and the only thing that he understands is violent faith. The Bible says the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Those that'll press in, those that'll move forward, those that'll say, you know what, devil, devil, Jesus said he's given me power over all the power of the devil and you, you and nobody else is going to stop me. I'm coming. I'm going to get my miracle. I'm coming and I'm going to see the power of God move in my life and I refuse to be refused. I will not stop. I will not give up. I'm here to stay. See, here's the thing. The only thing that Satan responds to is power. He doesn't have any honor. He doesn't have any respect. He doesn't have curt. The only thing that Satan responds to is power. And, the, and, 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 and I'm not saying this just power in its own self and just seeking power. No, I'm talking about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. But when he, the Holy Spirit comes, he comes in power. Now I want you to think about this. The only thing that you and I will, will ever truly honor and respect is power. Because if God said that he was God, but he was this puny little thing and couldn't do anything, who's going to respect that? Am I right? But he's the God that sits and he's enthroned in eternity. He created the heavens and the earth. He speaks and mountains move. The Bible says that the hills melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. Why? Because our God is a, is, is a consuming fire. He's powerful. And God is saying, take my power and bring it against the power of hell. Bring it against the power of Satan. See, the gates don't fight, but the gates will stand between you and, the, and, and your promise. And, and God is saying, bring my power against the gates of hell, and they'll respond. I can tell you this. If there is power, every one of us responds to power. If somebody was to put a nuclear bomb right here in the middle of this room, or, or just a regular bomb, we'd either get out of the way, we'd try to defuse it, but I can tell you this, we'd all have a response to it. Because it's power. And Satan only responds to power. So you can say, well, I, I love Jesus. And he says, yeah. And he keeps kicking you around. Why? Because you don't stand up in the authority that you have in Jesus Christ and be the believer that God has called you to be. It's not arrogance again, I'll say it. It's the assurance of knowing that you have been blood bought. And that Jesus Christ dwells in me. And I am a child of the King. That's not arrogance. That's not pride. That is assurance. That when the devil comes in. And he looks at me. I can tell you this. I don't have to cower. I don't have to stand in fear. I can look at the devil and say. Do you have any idea who you are speaking to? And until you begin to talk to the devil like that, he's going to take advantage of you. But when you begin to take your place as a child of the king, and it's not you, but it is Christ in you, the hope of glory, the power of God, 
that when you begin to speak, you don't speak on your own authority. You don't speak on your own power. You speak under his authority. And that devil has to obey.